Sorry about that little blip there, folks. Back into this. So going back to what McFadden and Rather just talked to us about avoiding editorializing. Editorializing is a journalistic term to denote when you're straying from that objectivity. So we just talked about earlier that an editorial is a type of opinion piece. You are editorializing in a news story when you start to insert that judgment into it. So for all of our stories, we're going to be trying to avoid that. So as McFadden noted in her discussion, we are all dripping with opinions. And so we do often find ourselves praising and critiquing as we write. And I want to show you how subtle this can sometimes be and why that can be a little bit confusing. So let's look here um, at a case like this one. It, we don't see the word I, we don't see I like or anything like this. This is from a story that was about New Year's resolutions that a student was writing um, whenever they were in my class in one of the earlier semesters. The key to achieving resolutions are in part stating a formal commitment and setting practical goals. However, it appears eliminating temptation is almost just as, if not more important. Those who set goals year after year could easily give up on these resolutions and become humdrum yearly commitments. So while we might not see um, this idea that it's like, I, the person's not saying, I think I feel, we're still giving advice here and we're not really saying where it comes from. So it becomes, if we're presenting it as a news story, our personal opinion. When I talked to the student, it turned out that they had done some interviews with a student who really had that. Um, so there, we went back and looked at their interview notes and saw, okay, this is actually the source it came from, what that person said, and they didn't have a great quote. So we went back and re-interviewed them, and we ended up with something like this. For example, Nova freshman Bob Smith said he believes stating a formal commitment, setting practical goals, is necessary for success. However, for him, eliminating temptation is almost just as, if not more important. I think people need to both make the commitment and keep themselves away from trouble, Smith said. That's why I'm staying away from my friends who vaped this month. So again, it was, okay, she'd gotten that idea from the original reporting, and then we're able to go back and say this is where it comes from. So now we've gone from making it editorializing to using our source to insert that opinion. Next, I want to talk about inverted pyramids. This is going to be really important for your upcoming first quiz. So this is coming from our text, Writing 5, Writing for Strategic Communications. So news stories organized using the inverted pyramid style, which means the information is in descending order of importance. This means you can read the most important information quickly. So essentially, in those first paragraph or three, two or three, you should have everything you need for the story. One way that an editor once told me to think about it was, if you are reading an inverted pyramid story, you should be able to stop after those first three things and still have the most basic facts, even though you might not know all of the hows and the whys of the story. So here's an example of one of the, perhaps the most famous inverted pyramid stories, which is about, as you can read right here, the assassination of President Lincoln. And so when we begin in those first two paragraphs, we've got the who, what, where, when, and why, and then we've also got the how right there. And then we've got that the president is going to die. So that, that knowledge is, is there, of course, at the time with, with medical advices being what they were, we would know that that was not going to happen. So the lead of an inverted pyramid, it's usually the beginning of the story. It's one to three short paragraphs and it gives the reader the most essential information and it does try to keep them reading. P.S. You might also see sometimes in journalism work, the word lead spelled L-E-D-E. -E. That's just to distinguish it from um, lead as in lead the metal. So both spellings are fine. Um, in the industry, some people do tend towards lead, especially older journalists, just so you know if you find that around. So what does that lead have to offer? There's our six basic questions, the five W's in an H. Who, what, where, when, why, how? And also, particularly as you get towards the end of the lead, so what and what's next? Those take into account your readership. Why does the story matter to them and why should they care? This is particularly important if you're reporting on an ongoing event, that what next, so that the reader might know what they need to prepare for. Is there a meeting they need to go to, something else that they need to do to better understand this full story? So deciding on how to structure a lead. Some things that would be to look at is what's the most interesting part of what you reported. So two crash cars on the Beltway near Washington, D.C. Each is one person. One walks away with just bruises, one is killed. And so what information do you put first if the person killed is important or well-known? A prominent politician. If the police believe the person who walked away was drunk. If there's recently been a recall on the safety belts of the car a person was driving. Or if you're writing the story while the crash is still being cleaned up, all the northbound lanes of the Beltway are closed, and it's 4.45 p.m. on a weekday. 
all of those are going to make different decisions. You know, this last scenario, if you're a reporter that gets this right now and we don't know anything about who's killed, but we do know that the entire beltway is closed, that's going to be the first thing that's going to go because your readers are probably checking the news real quick before they head out from their offices. Versus if you've got something where the car that killed somebody, there was just an important recall put out, that means there's probably other people with that issue of the safety belts and you're going to want to put that first versus even if everything we know about the car is safe, we don't see any foul play, this was just a terrible tragedy. If the person who was killed was really important, once you have that information, that's going to come first. Finally, I want to talk about the summary lead. So this is coming from our textbook. You can read look at it right there and it's going to concisely tell the readers the main idea of the story and its news value so if we look at this case of an example one from the textbook we've got this who what where when all covered in here and why it matters how important how important this is because of how often it's happening more than 20 percent so more than one in five and we've got 150,000 people at 27 schools that are all saying that this is something um, that is happening to um, very, very often. Okay, once you've created the lead, you want to give the reader more information in the body of the article. You'll be using direct and indirect quotes from sources to tell the reader the origin of the information. So again, this can all be found in detail in your textbook. This is the same story continuing. You see, after we name what's happening, we've got the quotes from our direct um, sources right here, including one of the university's presidents. And then we've got this summary quote right here that the researchers acknowledge the possibility. So you see there, it's not a direct quote, it's an indirect. The person is summarizing what the researchers had to say. Okay, so I hope that this was a great overview to this. Again, this presentation is here and available to read, and you are welcome to use it while you're completing your module quiz.